D. Garga. Um, perhaps you could start by maybe just summarizing for me your experience, your, your background as a filmmaker. Yes. Um, well, I studied filmmaking. Um, initially, I was training uh, to be a, a doctor, but um, in 1943, um, when I was a student in Lahore, um, I was arrested during the um, independence movement as a student. I was a courier carrying some revolutionary literature and all that. And extern from the city, I came to Bombay. I had to give up medical uh, ambitions and joined the, the college here, which was training students in cinematography. Mm -hmm. uh, even otherwise, uh, uh, photography was my uh, interest um, as a student, as an amateur. And um, I had won a few prizes in st still photography. Um, later on, I joined a studio which was training, uh, which took apprentices who were in um, cinematography, sound, and direction. In fact, that was the fil first film institute in India. This was in Bombay? This was in Bombay, started by a very well-known filmmaker, Mr. V. Shantaram. Mm -hmm. It was called the Film Institute, uh, not the Film Institute, Film Academy of India. And um, we were about seven or eight students. They couldn't accommodate many because the training was mostly uh, on the sets. It was a practical kind of training. You know, we had to uh, be straight away involved um, uh, in whatever department we chose to work in. And uh, from then on, I went into, I did a feature film in 47, 47, yes. But this was during the partition, mm -hmm. which in fact became a victim of the partition. Then on I um, decided to make documentary films. My first documentary was uh, shot in Kashmir, mm -hmm. soon after the partition. It was called Storm Over Kashmir. Um, it could be called the first political documentary, in fact. Mm -hmm. <coughs> was this for uh, Films Division? Or no, no. Films Division had not come into existence then. Uh, because, as you know, the history of Films Division, mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, what had started during the war uh, was disbanded in 1946 by the... Huh, uh, by the interim government, right, and uh, l uh, restarted in 1948. So it's 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 a bit of a tragedy that this uh, discontinuation of the films to uh, of the in what was then called the information films of India, because we had no unit to to uh, to film the partition or the independence of India. Mm -hmm. The transfer of power was never, never mm -hmm. um, uh, f filmed. The Films Division came into existence later in 1948. And so your film in Kashmir was an independent? It was independent. Uh, I had um, some help from the Kashmir government. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, otherwise we had to chip in our own money. This was at the time when there was war in Kashmir? There it? was war. Actually, I went to the front and uh -huh. uh, we shot some footage there. So y your film was uh, uh, supporting the, obviously, the Indian government's stand? No, it was not uh, supporting any government. It was a very human. I took the uh, story of a woman whose child and husband had been killed, mm -hmm. but we don't name the country. It I was see. purely a very human uh, um, situation which was taken up. Mm -hmm. And the war was used only in the background, not as a kind of obvious uh, mm -hmm. content. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, after 
after that, I did not make any documentary for several years because um, there was no chance of uh, making independent films because the films division had come into existence and I did not want to join the government of India as, a, um, as one of their staff members or something. Um, I did some feature film work in between and uh, did a lot of writing work because I was interested in research, the history of cinema, Mm -hmm. So I devoted a lot of time mm -hmm. and um, in 52 I went to Europe mm -hmm. and spent about five, six years in various countries mm -hmm. as you observe, as working with some units, film units, mm -hmm. spent a whole year in the Soviet Union mm -hmm. uh, working with Moss Film Studios, mm -hmm. things like that. So you really had a broad background uh, during those years, didn't you? Well, I mean, I met a lot of filmmakers there, made friends, mm -hmm. sometimes worked with them, and uh, I spent some time in Czechoslovakia, Barandov Studios mm -hmm. in Paris, mm -hmm. uh, various places. So you came back to India? In 58, I uh -huh. came back to India, and since then I have been making uh, documentaries. At the films division or both for in and out? Some for the films division, some on my own. Mm -hmm. I started on my own in the sense that I chose the subjects and made those films and mm -hmm. later on with great difficulty persuaded the films division to take up those mm -hmm. projects. Or I know I've seen one of them. I may have seen more, but I know I've seen one which is the Amrita Shergill one, yes. which is yes. quite late compared yes. to these other films. It's yes. a beautiful work. Yeah, it is. It, it, I, it, I had to, in fact, struggle for three years to get the project through mm -hmm. uh, because um, the, the officials in the ministry just would not understand um, the importance of Amrita Shergil, although they had named a street after her. But um, in fact, there's a story, one of the secretaries, joint secretaries or deputy secretaries, he thought I was making a film about uh, a Punjabi poetess. Her name happens to be Amrita, but she was Amrita Pritam. And the project was held up because they said, we don't make films about uh, living artists. <laughs> and the same thing happened with Satyajit Ray, which I made independently. That was the first film on Ray, mm -hmm. when he was not so well known. What year was this? Um, this was 63. Mm -hmm. And um, it took me eight years to um, have that film released through the film's division. Because they said he's still alive. How can we show a film about it? Well, they've changed their tune now, haven't they? They have changed their tune because people like me have been uh, at it, you know, I mean, made them see some sense. Mm -hmm. mm. Have your other projects over the years also had cultural subjects or has it? Yes, I made a film on um, the, uh, on Mahabalipuram, mm -hmm. the temples. Mm -hmm. And um, I had several projects. In fact, I had uh, given them a whole series of subjects on the creative artists of India. Mm -hmm. um, some of them they, I should say, pilfered in the sense that I suggested the subjects and then they said you can't have a copyright on a particular person. So they, uh, they put sound the like subject the mafia. as a kind of, uh, you know, and a general tender, a subject which I very much wanted to do about a, a very famous ghazal singer. She's no more. Um, I had talks with her. For over a year, I persuaded her husband because he wouldn't agree to uh, the filming. And um, later on, when she did agree, and I sent the proposal, they made it a general tender. You know, whoever is the lowest tender, he would get the film to make. And they made a mess of it. Hmm. We'll just pause for one minute. And okay, we're talking about <coughs> your films on cultural subjects.
mm. over the years. Have you also worked in other areas? Oh yes, a wide variety of subjects. You see, you have to understand that in India, where the uh, exhibition outlets are all controlled, it's not possible to venture on one's own and then expect that the film would be uh, yeah, firstly to raise the money to, to make a film and secondly it's not like the commercial film industry or a feature film where you can possibly probably um, recover your costs you have to willy-nilly go through the films divisions um, channels and uh, that is where in principle they say well anybody can release a film but that's not so in practice Mm -hmm. because it's a very complicated machinery. Um, the film has to be approved by the Film Advisory Board. Mm -hmm. uh, incidentally, now I'm a member of the Film Advisory Board, uh, <laughs> looking after the interests of the film producers. But uh, <coughs> even if the film is approved by the Film Advisory Board, there is no guarantee that the film can be released because no filmmaker is in a position to make so many prints for all India release and dub the film in 12 or 13 or 15 versions. Mm -hmm. So it's very frustrating. I mean, you, you may try, whatever you may try, you have to go back to film division. It's a tragic situation. It's a very frustrating situation. Uh, but uh, that's one reason that we cannot choose our own subjects. Either we have to have the subjects approved in advance mm -hmm. or uh, make a, a produce a film on a given subject. So this has obvious political repercussions, doesn't it? It has, it has. I mean, for example, the political comment would be uh, difficult to make. I mean, any political comment that is controversial or uh, not acceptable to the um, to the party in power. So this means, for example, that um, say during the emergency there was no. Oh no! It was a very dark period. But uh, you see, emergency is no ex was no exception because, as I have explained. Uh, there has always been a kind of emergency as far as the documentary film is concerned. Mm -hmm. Because when you have only one channel to pass through, mm -hmm. one outlet, mm -hmm. well, I mean, it's, uh, it hardly makes any difference whether you have political emergency or not. Mm -hmm. Recently, I get the impression that there are a few independents who are managing to survive maybe over the last 10 years these young filmmakers have emerged. Would you say the picture is changing a little bit? Well, the picture could change uh, quite a good deal if uh, there were openings, uh, uh, openings uh, with the Doordarshan, for example, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Indian television. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, uh, there too, it's, it's um, not so easy. Firstly, they are not very amenable to, to documentary uh, film showings. Mm -hmm. Very few documentary film projects get through. And after a great deal of uh, wire pulling or all kinds of wheeling dealing that goes on there. And um, so it's, um, if they open up, and in the, in the same sense that some of the uh, European networks or the BBC or Channel 4 mm -hmm. or uh, in France the, the television uh, which is very much more liberal now after De Gaulle. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, we have that kind of approach uh, I'm sure the um, uh, documentary would get a great deal of boost and um, mm -hmm. uh, the young people would be able to express themselves and uh, project real situations in, the, in, in, a, mm -hmm. in a very truthful manner. Coming back to the whole subject of cultural documentaries, I get the feeling that this has always been the, the area where Indian documentary has been most excellent 
the best achievement has been there. Yes, yes. And, and this is, my interpretation would be that this is because it's probably an area that is less political than others. Less political and there is another reason. You see the point is that there has been a political domination for the last, uh, during the British, for the last 200 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a kind of reaction, you know, a, oppressed people always sort of go back to their past mm -hmm. and uh, um, we have still not probably got over that kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, when the, um, uh, the filmmakers and the people in general, they mature, get over this trauma or whatever it was, um, I'm sure they would tackle other subjects because, I mean, I think it's it's all right to go back to the past, but it's, mm -hmm. it's not a very healthy sign. Still, I would say after 40 years of independence, I would say that still the cultural subjects are the most important. It, they are important. Mm -hmm. They are important because in a way they make uh, us a very large country and um, because of its diversity, ethnic and linguistic, mm -hmm. um, people are not aware of each other's cultural achievements or um, past and uh, both literary and artistic uh, that way it's in a way it brings the people together it's a, it's a part of the uh, process of uh, national integration mm -hmm. it has played that part it's a positive role mm -hmm. but at the same time I would say that um, one should not talk back too much mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the past you know I mean there is a Judging from the 60 films I've seen, I would say the other area of excellence would be biographies. Yes. And yes. probably that's for many of the same reasons that you've just gone over. Yes, yes. Uh, e even in the biographies, in fact, uh, the uh, of contemporary personalities where they have been involved in um, uh, political activity, you will find those are more interesting than, say, of a religious leader or... Mm. You mean the, uh, the biography of Nehru, for example? Nehru, that's what I'm... Biography of Nehru is interesting because of his political involvement, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, it, it sort of uh, makes you feel very proud of being an Indian, of being... Uh, 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 sort of relating to um, such an excellent personality. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. My own response to the Nehru films uh, was similar. I, I, I found it very inspiring. Uh, I also felt, though, that there was a kind of lack of critical distance of from course. the subject. Uh, that is bound to happen when you you are referring to the, the Sham Benegal, yes. Sham Benegal film. That is because of it's a co-production, mm -hmm. and um, um, co-productions cannot afford to be critical. Mm -hmm. It had to be a slightly goody-goody kind of film, which it is. I mm -hmm. mean, I mean, we are not now discussing the uh, artistic merit of the film because if you if we go into that, then we are of course it's a flawed work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you be more specific? No one will see this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not uh, uh, shy of making a comment. My uh, own um, thinking is along those lines, what you just now said, that it, it lacks any kind of critical um, analysis. And it's very easy to take refuge under somebody's uh, text, you know. I mean, they have used mostly Nehru's own words. Mm -hmm. Uh, which can be both his strength and the weakness of his artistic mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 on one side, uh, it makes the film pure and uh, not manipulative. But on the other side, it does not allow you to, to explore a subject deeply because you are not bringing in other personalities, other people, other contemporaries, other point of views, it's, the whole thing remains one-sided, mm -hmm. and that's, that's what I felt about the work. Mm -hmm. 
Um, before I started this project, I read your series of articles, I think four installments, on the yeah, the which I think are the really the best source for anyone interested in the history of Indian documentary. Oh, that's very kind of written. Um, so I've been testing all my reactions in, in comparison to your original mm -hmm. articles, and I found it very, them very, very valid. Um, for example, the, the chapter on the 60s and the, the problems of synchronous sound mm. I found very, very interesting. Mm. So when I saw all these films you mentioned, mm. uh, I was also very curious about the problem of sound and yeah. what Indian filmmakers would be doing with the new technology, technology. of sound recording. Um, I get the feeling that since that period, some of the freshness and originality of has those films has been lost. Why do you suppose that? Well, it is because they were, uh, I think basically they found that it's a, uh, synchronous sound is a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. uh, it brings you, um, brings an, in an element of reality and truth in a, in a, in a film, but at the same time, um, it may not serve the purpose for which the sponsor is sponsoring that film because he had not probably foreseen the situation and it's a very scary thing, you know. And um, uh, Films Division, which again we come back to the Films Division because that's the only agency, you know, um, got scared. They got cold feet and um, they abandoned the idea. Now, the interviewing uh, that you find in the films are mostly manipulative mm -hmm. because you can edit, I mean, you know all that. Um, the whatever statement, any statement can be distorted or can be, you can tailor it to your particular uh, design and uh, this is what is happening now. But the totally um, interview film or uh, synchronous sound film with the narrator has absolutely is totally absent uh, does not exist so um, in other words it's a political factor again because the control control everything boils down to that the control mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and documentary cannot operate um, under any kind of constraint or fear you know i mean mm -hmm. you have to it's interesting that these new young independent directors are, are really enjoying using synchronous sound. It's I know, I know, but sometimes they do it out of sheer, you know, just for the heck of it. Mm -hmm. um, man, not that they're terribly involved with the medium or the um, political situation. Uh, and that is why they gain sometimes just instant popularity and then they don't follow it up because mm -hmm. there is no deeper commitment, you know. Mm -hmm. Can you give me uh, an example? A um, uh, number of films which have been made by, just one film has been made on a situation and then no more, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, one or two people have been persistent. There is a group of uh, uh, Suhash Mule and um, Tapan Bose. Tapan Bose. Those, he, he's been mm -hmm. uh, consistent. But I don't know anybody else. The Patwardhan is there. Mm -hmm. But then Patwardhan is uh, not essentially a filmmaker. You could call him a um, social worker or a mm -hmm. person who's, who has a political kind of commitment. You know. mm -hmm. But amongst the young filmmakers, I can't think of anybody. They've just made one film and they get some kind of uh, exposure in the press and mm -hmm. after that. Mm -hmm. no Getting back to the, the whole question of experimentation and originality, one of the impressions I got as I was looking at all these films, division films, was that one of the reasons for the sort of inherent conservatism of so many of the films was that 
they were working in 35 millimeter and the fact that so much of the uh, originality of Western documentary during this period comes from the lightweight 16 millimeter technology, uh, this, the kind of personal filmmaking that became the style in the West is absent from India simply because there are these huge heavy cameras, cameras and, and the large and crews. The crews, yes. That is that's part of the reason. That's part of the reason and no effort has been made to develop 16 millimeter technology for example why shouldn't there be more units uh, of just two or three person small units you know mm -hmm. i mean like in europe they create sound recorders and a cameraman you mm -hmm. don't have a separate sound recorders assistant director director producer you know everybody uh, unit manager i think if that kind of thing happened probably it would have liberated the Indian documentary to a um, great extent. But unfortunately, the, um, there are two or three reasons. Firstly, the entire industry is geared towards 35 millimeter technology. Mm -hmm. And it's a very large industry. And uh, unless the industry uses 16 millimeter technology, uh, the laboratories or the sound uh, recording uh, studios, they don't find it commercially viable to, to set up uh, such studios or facilities. Secondly, Films Division has a monopoly on, they have to exhibit their films in say 10,000 or theatres. Now, they cannot uh, uh, set up 16 millimeter projectors unless they are either given free by the government mm -hmm. or they have um, to perforce show 16 millimeter films, you know, for uh, uh, commercial use. So, it the uh, with, with the result that 16 millimeter technology is not commercially viable. That is uh, one reason mm -hmm. the um, number of people have not gone into 16 millimeter. In fact, it becomes very difficult to edit a film. Suppose I shoot a film on 16, I have to blow it up on 35 millimeter to edit the film mm -hmm. because um, I can't find a steam back for 16 millimeter. I guess one reason it was possible in the West to use the new technology was that television already existed there. Yes, yes. And there was a huge investment from the television, television industry. I think so. That that was probably the main reason. And uh, mind you, in America, uh, there has been a great deal of resistance ex against the 16 millimeter technology, and um, the professionals are all have already gone back to 35. Professionals in documentary? Uh, professionals, um, whether in documentary or um, the large studios, mm -hmm. you know, who in some way sponsored, they all they f they find that I don't know. There is some kind of a prejudice or something, mm -hmm. and um, sixteen has not become that popular um, as it should have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In England, yes. In mm -hmm. England, because of the BBC insists on uh, shooting all their material on um, 16 millimeter, mm -hmm. um, so does Channel 4. But not so much in America. Mm -hmm. well, that's interesting. Also in the West, there's this alternative circuit of 16 millimeter distribution in schools and community groups and churches and everywhere that which is uh, again lacking here. Yes. You know, we have a very small um, non-theatrical uh, distribution setup. Mm -hmm. There are some universities, probably not so many religious groups, schools, and uh, uh, I can't think of a very large uh, mm -hmm. network. It's it's a small network. Mm -hmm. okay. Changing the subject a little bit. One of the other, the other 
point you make in this chapter on the 60s was about um, Sukhdev, uh, sort of a legendary mm. filmmaker. I don't know whether it was because he died young, but mm. uh, everyone mentioned Sukhdev as an example of the mm. very original and mm. uh, artistic achievement in Indian documentary in the 60s and 70s. Mm. Um, so when I got to see all of his films, I think I'd been set up a little bit too much for them, and I, I, I was a little Expect bit dis disappointed. Yeah. yeah, you see, <laughs> he was a very um, um, now how to he he was in his personal life a very um, outgoing. Um, effusive, a very daring kind of character, very mm -hmm. mm, extro he was a great extrovert. Mm -hmm. Now, he would take up causes and, you know, be all the time sort of uh, project the image of being a radical and uh, um, did things which somehow, and he had also, um, how to put it, he was, uh, I mean, we were very good friends. It's difficult for me to talk about him because um, the personal elements come into it. Um, but if one has to discuss his films, probably they will not, um, they will not last because they were the uh, they were created at that moment and they created this some kind of a sensation mm -hmm. at that moment mm -hmm. but, but when the moment was over they lost their mm -hmm. strength or value i mean that kind of feeling one got in his work even uh, when he was alive during our uh, mutual uh, conversations i used to mention to him that um, uh, they are not contemplative enough. Th th you don't go deep into things, but you get a thrill out of, you know, showing a dog being probably in front of a temple or, you know, things like that, which is all very well as if you can be irreverent, you, uh, which is a very nice element in a, in a creative artist. But you can't base your whole uh, mm -hmm. work on that kind of a gimmick. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that is what eventually uh, happens. In Gimmick was the word that occurred to me uh -huh, for a lot uh -huh, of, uh -huh. for example, a lot of his editing. A lot, lot of his editing is gimmicky. Mm -hmm. um, you see, what he lacked was a deeper thinking of anything. I mean, he just did things on the spur of, he got excited, take the camera, shoot, you know, something, and um, edit it in a very avant-garde, kind of manner which would excite, which would mm -hmm. like a kind of visual titillation, you know, you get, mm -hmm. but nothing more than that. That's, I think, one of the reasons you go back to films like so Song of Ceylon, for example, the technique may appear today very dated, but somehow at the end of the film you feel you have uh, gained some insight into a period, into a people, into mm -hmm. that is lacking. Yeah, I think I would agree. Mm. What would you say are the songs of Ceylon from the last 40 years of Indian documentary? <laughs> the ones that last, well, that the hold only, up? only song that I can, song of Ceylon is what's happening now. <laughs> uh, it's a veil of Ceylon. Um, we haven't really, again, you see, the, I'm sure you have gone into all that. Now, the 20-minute format mm -hmm. is, again, a very frustrating um, experience for any filmmaker. You cannot confine a film uh, into a given format. A film may be 10 minutes, it may be 5 minutes, it may be over in 2 minutes but it can go beyond 30 minutes, 20 minutes, you know. 
and uh, that's one reason when uh, where um, it's not been possible to tailor every film uh, and do justice to a subject and uh, I think that's one reason why we have not made any significant films on um, uh, tribals for example mm -hmm. on various um, there are no ethnographic films in fact in India they, we have some but they're very very bad mm -hmm. well there are dozens that aspire to that label no. um, I can't think of it um, the one or two but then as you say they just aspire to that label but uh, they lack the authenticity for example a Jean Rouge film mm -hmm. if you come to a good ethnographic film mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where because there's a lack of commitment and, and uh, lack of prolonged. commitment you see what happens that uh, or what has been happening is these are official films uh, they go to the location firstly the they have never researched the subject properly nobody has gone to a tribal area uh, they have uh, collected data or something from official sources the unit arrives on location meets the collector district collector or some some official and he um, establishes contact with uh, the village head mm -hmm. these uh, people, uh, the tribals are invited to uh, a suitable location away from their mm -hmm. habitat, make them jump out and do their usual dance mm -hmm. and this and that, and they shoot those films mm -hmm. and then take some general shots. And you can't make films like that. Mm -hmm. You have to to be a part of. It. Firstly, you have to establish a rapport, some kind of confidence, some... Those people must feel that you are a sympathetic um, person who wants to understand their way of life. They arrive there like sort of, you know, I mean, a city man's attitude towards tribals. I guess in that area, the, the most successful films are not about tribals, but are about traditional art forms. Um, for example, I, I've seen a couple films about folk theatre that are very observant and do have a kind of uh, committed regard for the form. Mm -hmm. I guess a few of those films yes, really. are not too yeah, bad. Yeah. Um, I also think that some of um, Manny Cole's films... Yes, Manny Cole's... Uh, uh, he has... his track... Firstly, he took up, uh, for example, the films he has made, one in Rajasthan, he comes yeah. from that area. Yes. And uh, he's felt about the subject and the people. He's done the film. So they reflect the kind of long-term commitment that I think yeah. the films division films yes. can't Yes. I'm afford. writing about it in my fifth... Uh, oh, I'm glad you're writing yes. a fifth yes. one. Mm -hmm. When is that going to come out? Next, uh, in the next issue, in April. Oh, good, because I thought there was sort of an abrupt end. No, no, it was not, but I was busy with the film, and uh, uh -huh. so I had to... Uh -huh. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. And so the fifth chapter is on... On the 70s. Oh, uh -huh. well, I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. <laughs> uh, let me just look at my notes, and I'll see if there's anything else I wanted to... Did you see a film called Dance of Shiva? No. Did you work on that one? Yeah. I, uh, I don't know how I missed that. Um, you can see it in Delhi. You see it in uh, USS. Okay. That was a film done, um, you see it was joint production with a friend of mine, Das Gupta, Chidan oh, yes. see Das Gupta. Uh, it was sponsored by the United States uh, mm -hmm. uh, information. information Agency. Yeah. And um, the f it's a it's a film on Anand Kumar Swami, the uh, great Indologist and mm -hmm. um, art scholar, mm -hmm. who was the 
who is the keeper of the Oriental section in Boston Museum. Mm -hmm. He's edited several books on Indian painting, hasn't he? Yes, yes, yes. all kinds. His Mughal, um, uh, his, um, on the Mughal miniatures, his work is very, very, um, it's a standard work. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to see that. Princeton um, University has brought out his collection mm -hmm. uh, of his uh, writings. Okay. You can see it in Delhi. Mm -hmm. If you ask the U.S. eyes okay. in Delhi, they will okay. organize it. Mm -hmm. um, getting back to your articles, one other thing that I was curious about was the influence of several of these foreign uh, filmmakers um, obviously Beveridge and um, Sills and some of the others um, 20 or 30 years later how would you evaluate their impact? I know at the time in the 50s it was very very important for the Indian documentary movement <coughs> you see uh, Within that context, it's very important. Uh, but um, away from that, I don't know. I mean, you have to judge it in a historical context only. Mm -hmm. um, people like Zils, who were very involved with the Indian documentary, because he was one of the, uh, in fact, uh, leading producers in the country. His influence is very important. And uh, he brought certain elements. Mind you, his own work is not greatly uh, of any great uh, artistic merit as such. But he had certain virtues which you find in German cinema. Of, uh, uh, it's a very neatly designed work. It. Uh, there's an overall neatness about it. You know, everything is clear cut, mm -hmm. which is both the strength and the weakness of uh, mm -hmm. uh, any such work. Uh, there was no complexity, uh, and that's why it lacked depth. You see, it was very linear kind of treatment always. But the lines were sharp and clear. Mm -hmm. And um, beverage influence could only be gauged in terms of his being a producer. Mm -hmm. He didn't make any films. Mm -hmm. He sponsored films because he was the head of the Shell Film Unit here. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, but apart from that, he was involved in India. He was involved in with the Indian filmmakers uh, at a personal level. So um, I should imagine that he helped in various other ways, but he did not sort of, there was no stylistic uh, contribution. Mm -hmm. um, others were peripheral because people like Rosalini and others, they came to India for a short time and mm -hmm. uh, probably they opened up um, a few minds to wider vistas. Mm -hmm. as you may say, but uh, uh, nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. So Beveridge's impact, you would say, would be largely personal. In terms of his personal, in, uh, personal contribution to certain individual's work or to... I would say that he, 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 he helped the independent uh, film producers as a sponsor more than anything else. Mm -hmm. He probably shaped their work also, but you see, it's like shaping, you can't shape it too much. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it's your work, your writing, I can probably contribute something mm -hmm. if you think that I may be able to contribute. Uh, but you can't entirely shape it like you would do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he within probably certain parameters he was able to, to uh, in 
contribute, but uh, not in a very large context. But people like Zils, who mm -hmm. trained um, other technicians, for example, Sukhdev was mm -hmm. his assistant. Mm -hmm. He learned a lot from uh, mm -hmm. Zils. Fali Bilimoria worked with him, and so many others. Who uh, his influence was deeper and um, mm -hmm. uh, wider. I wondered. I mean, I have no um, uh, answer to this, but I wondered whether the the predominance of the the classical voiceover narration form in Indian documentary maybe came from uh, those sources. No, it came largely because of the uh, linguistic pattern of India. You see, the point is that they could not make a film in one language. Mm -hmm. And if we, for example, um, if we had an interview film, say the interview could be only in Hindi or English or Tamil or Telugu in one language. Mm -hmm. Necessarily, you had to dub the film if it is to be given a wider um, mm -hmm. distribution. So that was one constraint. Mm -hmm. And that is one uh, argument which has been used by the films division that how can we make these uh, interview films when um, it has to be dubbed in a, for other regions. Mm -hmm. So this would you, you would say would be a major This was a factor. I think so. This was one of the uh, reasons why they found that it's easier to dub a film in 15 languages if it's a, just a uh, narration, narrated film rather than uh, uh, interview film, which would be difficult. Mm -hmm. But if they had thought that a subject is relevant, say, for example, to Tamil Nadu, mm -hmm. and you have interviews um, in Tamil, there was no reason why they should not have uh, made such made such films which could only be given a limited release. Probably they could have had a greater um, uh, impact and um, uh, usefulness. This all India kind of, you know, this uh, distribution, I think, has destroyed even the general character of documentary because it has lacked any regional identity. And roots it's, in a specific it's, it's in a specific area. Mm -hmm. You see, suppose I'm making a film about Punjab, mm -hmm. unless of course it's a film to promote tourism or you know something else. That's a different. But suppose we are making a film about uh, the Punjab situation. Mm -hmm. Necessarily, the interviews have to be conducted in that language mm -hmm. or if you are the, they can speak English language or Hindi or something they would probably speak in English or Hindi <coughs> then you can uh, give it probably slightly wider exposure but I said, um, uh, if they had probably had a regional approach in their documentaries I think they would have uh, acquired a greater um, authenticity. I think that makes a lot of yes, sense. Yes, because because they have no regional character. Yes, they have no roots. They have no authentic, authentic touch about them. Yeah. So this whole project of national integration, national integration was also a double-edged. Uh, it's a double-edged because you are not achieving anything thereby. Mm -hmm. Because. Nobody relates to uh, to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it's a, if it's if it's a film shot in say Bihar, a Punjabi doesn't re relate to it. Mm -hmm. Have any of the state governments um, sponsored? Uh, yes, they have made films, but then those films are purely um, touristic kind of films, you know. Mm -hmm. What are the um, your main uh, arguments in your article in the 70s that's about to appear? Can you give us <laughs> a preview? I'm still writing. I'm still writing. Are, are some are certain points sort of coming to the surface? The points uh, I have to um, in the 70s we had 
this dreadful emergency. That's mm -hmm. one thing which I have to talk about. And um, but these, the early part of um, the 70s was very fruitful because we had people like Mani Kaul and Kumar Shani, yeah. Sean Benegal made films. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. The documentaries by those people are very uh, seldom discussed in, in the, the literature on Indian film. I mean, I, I was curious that, <laughs> that someone like Aruna Vasudev, who writes a lot about Indian film, always skips over she their documentaries. Because you see her involvement has been very late in the, mm -hmm. the Indian cinema. Mm -hmm. So she hasn't uh, seen much. Uh, Which of um, Benegal's documentaries are you particularly fond of? I'm talking about his early documentaries which he made while he was still with Linters. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had made a film on... Um, he shot a film um, in Bastar, in the tribal area, close to nature. Then he shot a film about the youth unrest or something. He sh shot a film, um, youth and exploration. He made a film. Mm -hmm. um, then one or two films uh, were on. Uh, one film he made, Child of the Street, mm -hmm. Streets, now uh, which was about. Uh, um, one of these vagrant mm -hmm. children. So th these were some. They had a certain impact in that period. Well, they were fresh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they because uh, they didn't follow the official mm -hmm. diktat or approach, mm -hmm. so they were different. I'm sorry, I haven't seen them. The only one from that period that he showed me was Simhastra. Uh, Sinhas? Yeah, it's about uh, that Kum Mela or something? Yes. Oh, yes. yes. About the sadhus and yes. all Yes, which oh. was very interesting. Yeah. Um, he may not be having the prints or something, I don't mm -hmm. know. And with regard to the emergency, um, what is the general pattern? Everyone running for cover? Or? Well, naturally, I mean. <laughs> There was no chance of doing anything else. Mm -hmm. One had to, or most number of people did not uh, make any films. Mm -hmm. I, yesterday, I just saw Sukhdev's film from the emergency. Yes, the which um, after the silence. Yes, yes, which I found quite amazing, mm -hmm. or in, in a very contradictory and convoluted kind of way. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if he was attempting to to use the emergency to or use the official discourse to subvert it in some way. Uh, I know he was often criticized for going along with the emergency. <laughs> it's a very you see he had to it's it's one of those books you know you have one leg here one leg there and you just can't decide or you want to be ambiguous mm -hmm. in a situation like this where he was opposed to emergency I mean it would be uh, he was in fact he had developed a kind of paranoia he, he thought that he would be arrested or mm -hmm. would be so he was very close to all those people mm -hmm. the film just includes this strange praise for endurance very uh, close to Sanjay Gandhi, for example. Was he? Uh -huh. I, th I wondered whether in praising Indira's attempt to do away with bonded labor, whether he was trying to... Uh, you know, this was a program, I'll tell you, this was a program which, the 20-point program, he somehow managed to convince the, um, the ministry that um, it's let a independent set of people make these films uh, on a 20 point program which uh, bonded labor was one of those mm -hmm. films and uh, there was a film on housing I made a film on housing uh, mm, largely because 
so they prevailed upon me to make it. Uh, but I did not use any narration. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, that was the interview film. Mm -hmm. uh, very um, sometimes critical of the government um, because we shot that in the slum areas mm -hmm. mostly. But and somehow that escaped the 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 punishment that could have been inflicted. Well, these people <laughs> don't look at films very carefully, or, or they don't look at them very. Yeah. Uh, because it was not uh, passed by the film advisory board. I see. And uh, I had to take it to Delhi, and I showed it to the. Not to Shukla, who was the minister, uh, who was the, um, but his deputy saw the film, and strangely enough, he liked it, so he approved it. Oh, I'd love to see it. Uh, it's called Roof Above. I don't know whether it's uh, today how it looks like. Roof. It, roof above. Above. The roof. Uh, the roof above. Mm. I don't know how. It, look like now, mm. but uh, it was one of those. One um, impression I've got of a sort of a healthy current of maybe the 80s is all these young women filmmakers who seem to be working in a very, uh, from a very fresh perspective. Mm. Do you agree with that? But frankly, I haven't seen very much of their work, but um, Whatever little I have seen, I think it's it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Some of the more interesting films made recently, uh, for example, Mira Devon, Mira Devon and uh, no, some of the others. Dory. And yes. So, um, why don't we conclude by summing up? What do you think are the What's the prognosis for the immediate future? You see, the, in, at the moment, the Indian documentary is at, in a bit of a doldrum uh, because the position of the films division is fairly uncertain at the moment. Now our hope is pinned only on Doordarshan, if they would open up um, their uh, mm, channels mm, where it's possible to explore um, the Indian situation, Indian realities, um, which is what a documentary is all about, I think we have a very uh, bright future. Uh, but if they don't, at the moment, I don't see very many signs mm -hmm. because documentary can be very frightening for the establishment. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, just to justify their own existence, they may show a few films which have a s social relevance. But when it comes to a regular kind of uh, uh, project or a program, you know, they shy away from that. Mm -hmm. And um, if that happens, I don't see a, a very bright future for the Indian documentary. But I hope it uh, it will not be that. You know, I mean, I I l like to be a optimist about it. Okay. Well, let's conclude then on that optimistic <laughs> note. <laughs> <laughs>